Um, it is a great honor and privilege for me today to invite up our guest speaker. Um, Sandy started coming to our church a few months ago, and um, any of you who have been part of our church for a while, you've heard us say probably a hundred times now that God started giving us, I mean, over many years, he'd give us like visions and ideas and all of you. And, and as we heard things, we were like, okay, we got to write these down. So we got all these big whiteboards. We started writing things down. And uh, there was one particular week where we had been looking at, okay, how does God want us to equip the church and our community? And under one section, I had written, um, we had been talking and I wrote, we need gr grief counseling, inner healing and deliverance equipping. And I think it was a week later, maybe two, um, Sandy came up and I met her for the first time um, as uh, she came up for prayer. And so she's telling me a little bit and then she says, oh, and by the way, what I do is grief recovery, inner healing, deliverance. That's my job. And I'm like, sorry, I'm going to fall over right now real quick. <laughs> then I'll pray for you. Um, and honestly, like there have been so many things like that, but, but this one has been one of the most clear that God went, this is what I want to do. And Hey, guess what? I'm going to bring the right people and the right person to bring it. And, um, there have been moments where I've been concerned cause I'm like, Oh my gosh, I feel like you walked in and we're like, okay, we need everything you have, all the anointing, all the knowledge, give it all. Come on. And she's like, wait, I came here to go to church. Like what's going on. Um, but one of the best moments for me was we were having coffee and she said, you know, I just, um, for a long time, have been looking for my tribe, and I feel like it's this. <laughs> this is my tribe. And we're so glad that you're part of our tribe, Sandy. Um, I have, my life has literally been turned upside down um, in the best way possible because of Sandy and what she brings and the heart that, um, that her story that she's allowed God to enter into and bring, like, the most radical healing I've ever seen. So... I just know that she's going to bless you today, that the Lord is going to speak through her. And will you please all welcome up Sandy Derby. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me? Am I on? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Whoops. Let's start with prayer. Lord, we lift up your name. We claim your powerful presence that is already in this room. We know that you alone are above all, in all, and through all. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit guide and really speak the words this morning, that you get me out of the way, that if there are people here, Father, that need to hear something, that you would open their hearts. And I pray for each and every person that is listening, that if something hits their hearts, whether it's a trigger or a resistance, that they would lean in and be able to hear what it is that you want them to receive. God, let this be your message. And we claim your power in this room in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. So a little bit of my, my story, and I always say it's not my story because I would have written it very differently. This is God's story. You know, there was a moment in 2005, and in 2005, I was not a Christian at all. I had never even opened a Bible. But 2005 was a year that I started to ask questions, and all of them started with why. Why? Why was I a drug addict? By 2005, I had been using meth every day for three and a half years. Why had I chosen a man who tried to kill me? In 2003, I was almost killed by an ex-boyfriend who attacked me in Hollywood. And why didn't I remember a lot of my childhood? It was the first time in my life that I asked these questions. And you know, when we ask questions, we get answers. And I didn't get the answers all at once, but as I turned and asked, I did not get easy answers. The truth is, I had grown up in a very abusive home. I was verbally, physically, and sexually abused for almost my entire childhood. There were many men in my family who abused. There was a lot of significant abuse in my nuclear family. I was assaulted at the age of seven, again at the age of 12. The other ingredient in my home was denial. There, I used to say there could be 10 elephants in the living room and we would just walk around them as if they weren't there. Nobody was talking about anything. And so I took that. I took that denial and I went out into my life and I piled on a lot more things. I went into a lot of risky situations. I used a lot of drugs. I did a lot of medicating to try to numb the pain. And even though by 2005 I was high up in the corporate world, 
I'm probably one of the very few meth addicts that was actually corporately successful, which is, I think it just speaks to my childhood. I could function in a lot of dysfunction. But as I asked those questions in 2005, there were some significant things that happened. One of them was that as I was in a kind of drug-induced state with a group of friends, I had really started to go into new age, thinking I was finding myself and being very spiritual. So I was really walking towards the darkness. In a moment where I had just done a tarot reading for somebody, God interrupted. And right after that, I had what some people might call like, like a near-death experience is, is the only way I can describe it. But God literally interrupted where I was and spoke to me. And for the first time in my life, I went from, I don't even know if God is real, to, okay, you're real. Again, never been in church, never read a Bible, never prayed a prayer. But the next morning, I got up, and I remember looking in my mirror, and I talked to God for the very first time. I said, okay, you're real, and I'm in. That's all I knew. It wasn't too much longer that as I was starting to connect more and more to the answers of those questions, I took action. I took some action, and I did some reporting on a family member, which meant everything with my family was blowing up. That same week, now remember, I'd been using for three and a half years, daily. I had given money to this guy. I used to call him, I'd be like, yeah, I gave money to my friend, but he was actually my drug dealer. And I gave him money, and he didn't come back. And then he didn't come back the next day. So out of anger, I called and left him a message, and I said, hey, give me my money back. I don't know many drug dealers that return money, but I <laughs> left the message anyway. <laughs> and that night as I went to bed, I had a little thought. I like that glimmer that comes in. And the thought was, if he brings me back my money, it's time to stop. And the next thought was, if he brings me drugs, I'm going to keep going. It was not a big epiphany. It was a little glimmer. And I woke up the next morning, and I walked to the kitchen, and I caught something out of the corner of my eye, and I walked down the hallway to find an envelope under my door full of cash. He gave me my money back. That was the last day that I used. That's God. At the time, I didn't even realize the power of God. I, I wasn't even aware that this was all him. That just that little, like we talked about, that little mustard seed of faith to just say, you're real. And he was moving. That was in October of 2005 that I walked away. January of 2006, I was on an airplane and I ended up sitting next to not one, but two pastors. <laughs> God was like, we're going to make sure. And I was at the window seat, so I had no way to get out. <laughs> and so we conversed, you know, the entire time, and they invited me to a midweek service. I was living in Hollywood at the time, and it turned out the midweek service they invited me to was walking distance from where I lived. So I went into that midweek service. It took me a little bit, but March of 2006, and then April, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I was baptized. So I went from a meth addict to a follower of the Most High King in six months. It was quite the whirlwind. You know, and it was really interesting because I became a Christian. I was part of this community, and people were hugging a lot, and that was a little hard for me. However, I was really excited, and I had all these answers. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, and this is what my family chose, and now I'm choosing this, and this is great. And it didn't take long. Within a few weeks, I started to ask more questions. And they all started with why. But this time they were directed at God. Why didn't you protect me? Why did you allow people who were in authority to hurt me when I had no power? Why are you just coming to me now? And how in the world could I ever pick up the pieces? I had gone to this conference and they'd had this class and it was intimacy with God. And they talked about the Psalms David in the Psalms, and how he was so emotionally honest. And that really broke something in me. And I call that my wrestle season. I wrestled, and I wrestled, and I cried out. And all those parts of my heart that had all the pain and the anguish, I started to really let them out with God. I love um, 
when Jacob in Genesis, you know, wrestles, right, with God. And it's like after the wrestle, his name was changed to Israel. So the name Jacob meant deceiver. And actually, when it was changed to Israel, it means wrestle with God. But one of the other things that I think is really important and what was really important to me is having grown up in so much abuse and having felt so invisible and so small, I think there was a part of me that expected to get a response from Jesus like I got from others. And well-meaning people who loved me and wanted to help me were giving me very theological answers about free will and a fallen world. And they made sense here, but they didn't hear. You know, in Matthew 12, 15, it talks about Jesus, and it talks about how the Pharisees were plotting to kill Jesus. And it says, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. Jesus is a healer. He warned them not to tell others about him. Now, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Jesus met me in all of the broken places. You know, I grew up in New York, and when I say New York, people go, oh, you grew up in New York. And I'm like... It's upstate New York. It's nothing like New York City. It's so rural. And we do have swampland there. And in the swampland are reeds. And they're very, very sturdy. As a matter of fact, you brush up against one, it will cut you. It hurts. The moment that a reed is bruised, it flops over and you can just break it so easily. And that's how part of my heart felt. Parts of my heart felt so, so bruised, like they could just snap in a moment. But Jesus did not come with theological answers. He met me there. And that was the first time in my life that I ever knew love. I always say my first true love was Jesus. And that's, you know, we're talking also about health and being emotionally healthy. Wrestling with God is one of the best things that you can do. I think we learn way too much sometimes in our Christian communities that it's not okay to bring those things to God. Yet the evidence in the Psalms, I mean, Jesus is my favorite, but David is really up there for me. (laughs) I love David. I mean, he had a lot, right? But it says, the Bible says, David is a man after God's own heart. And yet we have more evidence of the wrestle. I mean, I feel like David's story, we get a bigger picture of David's story than anybody else in the Bible. You have to wonder why. Why do we have the Psalms? It's that wrestle. Sometimes there's parts of our heart that we just don't even want to give over because we think, I'm not supposed to think that or feel that. Or, that's too painful. I just need to skip over it. So wrestling with God is really important. I think the other thing that I had to really learn and discover as I became a new believer and as I walked with Jesus is, you know, there was this moment, right, when I was baptized, and it was amazing. And I felt like, well, everything should be good now. I should be fine. As a matter of fact, people were telling me that. You're, you, you have this new life. You should be totally good. You shouldn't be dealing with anxiety and depression. By the way, I was waking up that way every single morning. But I want to take us just for a moment. I'm just going to reference the book of, of Joshua The book of Joshua in the Old Testament is arguably one of the bloodiest books in the Bible. As the first time I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, God, you're so mean. Because I really didn't understand. (laughs) But when you really look at the book of Joshua, there's so much in there that gives us foresight into our new covenant. Because in the book of Joshua, they are entering into the promised land. Finally, right? Finally. They get to go into the promised land. But what is God telling them? He's saying, go, and I want you to get rid of all that is not of me. And I will be with you, right? So God didn't ask them to make that journey on their own. As a matter of fact, some of our big miracles come in the book of Joshua. I mean, the sun stood still. It's amazing. 
But God was with them as they journeyed into the promised land. And it was a land overflowing with milk and honey, but they had many battles to overcome. And it wasn't that God just went in and took the enemies out. They co-labored with him to clear the land, yeah. right? Yeah. So now if we look at the Old Testament and go, wow, this is such a great foreshadow for our new covenant. Now when we go into the new covenant, we look at like an Acts 2, right? Acts 2 is where we're talking about coming into Pentecost, right? Pentecost is such an amazing time when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the believers. And then there's this amazing uh, interaction that happens where people are coming and they're saying, oh my gosh, are these people drunk? And Peter's like, no, it's like 10 in the morning. They're not drunk. <laughs> but he, he, he gives this sermon and he talks to them and he tells them, you know, repent and be baptized, and you're going to receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and your children and your children's children and all who are far off. So all of us get to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Joshua, God was with them. Now we have God within us, right? Which is amazing. God, now we're empowered for the journey. Tertia did an amazing job. I loved, loved, loved her sermon last week where she talked about there's now and not yet. The now is, yes, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what happens in that, there is a bit of a transaction. If we look at Colossians 3.3, 3, it says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. The Bible talks about how our old life dies, and then we're hidden in Christ. When we think of life, you want to think of, like, what is my life force? It's my spirit. My spirit participates in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and is hidden in Christ. And that is absolutely amazing. And now, instead of it being this outward view of this promised land that, we're, that they're walking into, if we look at 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Now, we're that territory. And you know what? If we were just spirit it would be done. We'd be raised to the new life and it would be done. But then we go to Galatians 5 and now what's happening? It says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another. Oh, so there's battles just like in Joshua. Now, flesh in Galatians, comes from a Greek word. It's called sarx, S-A-R-X. Sarx means a component of our being that is not under the power or the unction of the Holy Spirit. So basically, there are parts of us that even after we become believers that still need to be taken over for the Holy Spirit. We are co-laboring with Christ through sanctification to be more of him and less of us, right? And so... I think what's really important is then, what are those other parts? Well, if we go to Matthew twenty two thirty six, 36, where Jesus is asked, which commandment is the greatest in the law? And we all, I think, know this one. I feel like this is one we say a lot. Jesus declared, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The Bible tells us the other parts of us that are still being sanctified for him. And that is why healing is such an important and paramount part of our journey. I think so often when I walk with people, and I know this happened for me a bit too, sometimes they can feel frustrated, like, wait, I, I, I accepted Jesus and I did all these things, and how come I don't feel better all the time? Why do I still wake up hurting? This is why. You're empowered for the journey. You have the Holy Spirit. You've given the, been given the best gift you could ever have, and your salvation is secure. But now, as we walk with Jesus, we want more and more and more to be under him. And that's what healing does. I think a lot of times we hear about sanctification, but we're not always given the right tools or language. And so that first part, I think, is so important, where it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. We're talking about emotional health. Now, most of the time, when I ask people, what does the Bible say about the heart? This is what they quote me, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure, who can understand it? 
And that's where they stop. <laughs> and so therefore, a lot of times what we're taught is your emotions will fail you. They're deceitful. Ignore them and suppress them. That's what we learn. And that's really unfortunate. Jeremiah 17.1, if we actually go to the, the top of that passage, it says, Judah's sin is engraved with an iron tool, inscribed with a flint point on the tablets of their hearts and on the horns of their altars. When you read Jeremiah in context, there's a couple of things. One, there are some theologians that believe that heart is actually translated nature. And then in Ezekiel, when, he, when God talks about, I will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, that it's prophetic word about the Holy Spirit. In addition, I believe the other layer to Jeremiah is that Jeremiah is giving us a picture of what sin does to our hearts. Not only what we've done, but what has been done to us or not done to us. And so what happens is, is that when those things happen, yeah, if we have a bunch of pain in our hearts and a bunch of things within our soul, our emotions can, can feel deceiving. They can erupt at times when we're not wanting them to. But really what we need to do is we need to look at that and go, oh, this is an indicator that there's something in here that God wants to heal. Not, oh my gosh, look how bad I am. Now, the reason that we also know that God cares about our hearts, I love Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. Us having our hearts clear makes room for God to talk to us, to connect with us. By the way, we're made in the image of God. God is emotive. The language in the Bible, it's emotive. God's a jealous God. There's times when he's a raging fire. God is love. There's so much language in the Bible that shows us that God feels. And us feeling is a reflection of his nature. So the other uh, scripture, Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God cares a lot about our hearts. He cares when things have happened. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. I walk with a lot of people. I was one of them in a lot of pain, a lot of emotional pain. And I can tell you when we're walking with a lot of pain, we tend to feel hopeless. We tend to feel like things don't matter. We tend to dull down. That's why the scriptures say that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But God doesn't want us to have our hearts sick. God wants us to step into a fulfilled longing. He desires that for us as a good father. You know, we were made for the garden. We weren't made for the fall. Anything that happens to us outside of our original design causes pain. Some of you may hear my story and go, okay, I don't even, that's not my story. Or some may hear my story and go, I, you know, that is my story. I see pieces of it. But the point is, is that in, in truth, anything that happened or didn't happen outside of our original design, you're going to have pain inside. Sometimes I walk with people and it's, wow, people did things to me that, that, that shouldn't have been done. That hurts, right? I lost a lot as a child. I lost my innocence. I lost connection. I lost love. I lost safety. I lost control. But sometimes it's, you know, it's not that something happened that shouldn't have. It's that something didn't happen that I needed, whether it was emotional connection or physical. That can be a loss of identity. There's a lots and lots of things that happen that God wants to heal. And a lot of times what I see is that we can maybe even get that really great prayer and have that breakthrough, which is amazing, and I'm all about that. But the miracle doesn't negate the process. 
when they were going into the promised land, there were miracles after miracles after miracles. I mentioned the sun stood still. There are things that only the Holy Spirit can do. But that didn't negate that the Israelites had their part. We have our part too. And that's why I'm so passionate about this subject. Because I went from somebody who was waking up every day, even after I became a believer. As a matter of fact, a little bit more so, I feel like, when I became a Christian. Because I started to connect a little bit better because of the Holy Spirit. And I was like, I can't even get out of bed. It felt like if somebody even sends me a text message, I'm going to fall over. Like, that was my morning every morning. And I went from that to life is vibrant. I had never, ever, ever had an experience in my entire conscious years of being able to wake up in the morning and go, there's joy, there's color, the sky is blue, the grass is green. But because of the healing in the heart and in the soul, learning the tools to face, embrace, and release pain, life started to look very different. I'm going to leave us with a scripture in Ecclesiastes 7.3. Um, I'm going to share from a couple of different versions because I think this is so good. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. Um, that's the NLT version. The ESV version says, sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. These scriptures speak to grieving, that when we face what's in our hearts and we express it and it's out, we actually feel better. The idea of grief is that grief is meant to be transformative. God gave us that so that what happens can be transformed into character, hope, pain, uh, uh, plan, purpose, right? That's, that's what it's for. But I think in my own life and in so many of the people that I've walked with, we don't know how to do that. So what I want to leave us with today is what have you lost that God wants to restore? What are, what are some things that you look back on and go, I've given up hope in this area that I would ever feel joy here? Or I've given up hope in, over here that I, this would ever be restored? What is that? And I think the other thing is too that so many times even in our Christian walk, we experience things in this life. Sometimes they're hard. And not only do we want to learn our own emotional health, because by the way, when you are carrying a lot of stuff inside, emotionally, it affects you in every area of your life. There's physical symptoms that come. There's emotional, mental it affects every area. It affects your ability to connect with others and your ability to connect with God. So think about that one. Ask the Holy Spirit. What is it that you want to resurrect in my life? I used to say as I was walking through my own healing journey, I felt like I would walk into landmines because I had so many suppressed parts of my being and my childhood. And I used to say, my goodness, it would be like in order for that to be resurrected, it'd like come up and there's the pain. But then having the, the tools and the things to walk through it meant that I could get on the other side. And there was always beauty on the other side, always. And there is for everyone here. So I just want to take some time and I want to pray for us. I want to pray for you. I want to, I want to pray for just the courage to face what you're carrying inside. Lord, we thank you for being here. I thank you for each and every person that is in this place. Thank you for their hearts. Thank you for the journey that they're on, that they've chosen you, that they've chosen to impact others in their lives. I ask now, Father, for anyone here that has experienced pain of any kind. I pray that Jesus would move next to that place within their heart that maybe has been hidden away or they haven't known what to do. 
or they felt frustrated and alone. I pray that Jesus would step into that place. I think of the scripture in Matthew 28 where Jesus says, you know, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. I pray for a week of honesty, Lord. I pray that they would have times where they could wrestle with you and bring the places in their hearts out honestly. I pray for any experiences that they may have experienced, each and every person growing up, where there may be hurt, even if it's hidden. Lord, you're powerful and you're mighty, but you're also gentle. I had a vision recently of God and he showed me this picture and he was so big and he actually came down to this small size and he whispered in my ear like, I'm here too. Sometimes God can seem so big and so global that we forget that he actually cares about every nook and cranny of our hearts. And I pray for each and every person's nook and cranny that you would bring healing, wholeness, power, and strength, that you would lead each person to where you want them to be. And I claim your inner healing, Lord, and your power. We lift you up. We give you all glory. We give you all honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. There? All right. The whole time Sandy was talking, I just felt a stirring of the spirit that God is doing something new and healing in this place and and actually to quote something that um, I've heard Sandy say say, is your past is your present until it is healed and that's the truth many of us want to just jump over and ignore the past and keep going forward but your past will always come into your everyday life your decisions even physical health all of these things until it is healed And next week, we're actually going to, after the service, um, Sandy's going to have a meeting uh, for anyone who really wants to take this journey. And if today you felt that, like, okay, there are, there are losses that God wants to restore, and I'm ready to take that journey, I'm ready to get emotional healing, I want to really encourage you to come next Sunday after the service, uh, hear what Sandy has to say. Uh, We're going to be doing a whole bunch of different things ongoing from now on, uh, but there's going to be some things that you can actually plug into to really practically get these tools for healing for your life so that you can live connected and so that your, your soul and your heart um, can actually catch up to what God says about you that's already happened in your spirit. And so I really want to encourage you to come to that. And right now as we worship, um, I just want to invite you again, just as Sandy just prayed, just to continue to allow God into those spaces that you'd allow the wrestle, but not in such a way that you're, I don't know, yelling at God, but that you're actually going, okay, God, I can yell at you, but you're right here. (laughs) Inviting him into the wrestle. You know, uh, those of you with kids might know this, but like, you know, when you pick up, like my kids love to pack bags. Like they just fill bags with stuff. It's like, oh my gosh, like, uh, just cleaned up. And then you just take it all and put it in the bag. But sometimes you, like, pick up a bag, and you're like, what'd you put in here, rocks? And then you open it up, and there's literally rocks inside. It's like, oh, my gosh. But the crazy thing is they don't just take one big rock and, like, Ugh, and like put it in the bag. They're, like, a bunch of little rocks, tiny rocks. Like, you pick up one. It's, like, it's not very heavy. But as you, like, put a bunch of these rocks in this bag, the bag gets super, super heavy. And that's one of the things about carrying around emotional pain that we've learned. It's like carrying a bag of rocks on your back. You know, some people might think, well, you know, my story, you know, comparing to somebody else is like, that person went through some crazy, crazy stuff. I have no place to complain. But the truth is, you still got rocks in your bag. (laughs) And you could carry it around. You could carry it for the rest of your life. You're going to be really broke down and tired. And maybe you're like, well, I just got to get through my life and then I'm going to heaven. It's like, yeah, that's true. But like Jesus wants to take the 
rocks out of your bag right now. Yeah. And there's ways to do that. There's hope for that. You don't have to carry that heavy bag for the rest of your life. Um, so just to, you know, ditto what Tertia said, like, seriously, yeah. Yeah. <laughs>